first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. I'm sorry, not Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, I think it is. Genesis 2. Beginning in verse 8, and if you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word, I read today from the King James text. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also is in the midst, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Python, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good, there is Delium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. Now I just want to jump down to verses 16 and 17 and read, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Would you bow your hands with me, Master? We thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. We ask God, as the word of God is about to come forth, we so desire your presence and your anointing, God, that every heart might be touched that everyone, Lord, might receive what you would have them to receive at this hour. Nourishment for their souls, encouragement, God, in their Christian walk. Master, anoint your messenger today. Anoint the ears that hear, those that are here, those that will hear by tape at a later date. Master, allow everyone to receive today this wonderful truth that you desire to impart unto them, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you, and amen. You may be seated today. I want to talk to us for a little while today, it won't be very long, on the topic of from milk to meat. From milk to meat. It was interesting that God created man and he placed him in a garden which he had created. And this garden occupied a very specific portion of ground. It occupied a very specific parcel of land. The Garden of Eden did not cover the entire face of the earth. No, it only covered so many acres or so many uh, square miles or however God measured it out. And it's interesting to me that there are so many in the Main Street Church Society that want us to believe that God created man and uh, woman, Adam and Eve, originally from the beginning, right off the starting line, as flesh and blood human beings with the sole purpose of procreation. That would have been a very bad plan, Joaquin. If I put you in a piece of land that's only so big, and then I tell you to have kids and have more kids and have more kids and just keep having kids and have your kids having kids, after a while something is going to happen. It's called overpopulation. You're going to crowd out that little piece of land that you've been placed in, aren't you? Amen. And Adam and Eve had to stay in the garden. They had to live in the garden. It was not possible for them to travel outside of the garden. Why? Because the tree of life was in the garden. And they had access to the tree of life. God created Adam and Eve 
to live forever. They were designed to live forever. From the first moment Adam took his first breath, he was never to taste of death. He was never to know what death even was. The only prohibition that God put on Adam was, uh, out of all the trees in the Garden of Eden, do you know what Eden means? Do you know what the word Eden means in Hebrew? It literally means pleasures. The garden of pleasures. That's why the Bible said that all the fruit trees and all the plants that grew in the garden were pleasant. Everything about it was pleasant. It was good to taste. It was good to touch. It was good to the feel. Everything about the garden was pleasant. There were no thorns there for Adam to prick his fingers on. There may have been roses, but there were no thorns. Because everything in the Garden of Eden was pleasurable. It was pleasant. And it's the same for the believer today. We look forward to a day when having believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and obeyed his gospel, we look forward to the day when God's going to redeem his church, take us to heaven, celebrate a wedding, come back and defeat the Antichrist and the false prophet, put them into a fiery burning hill, and then we are going to stand and watch as the God of all creation uh, renovates and redoes this planet from one end to the other, burning it up by fire, and then replanting it, and the entire planet will become a garden of Eden. The entire planet will become a place of pleasures. The entire planet will become a place where no thorn will ever grow to prick your finger, and no snake will ever bite you on your heel. Hallelujah, glory to God. No lion will ever seek to devour you, because it will be a land of peace, where the lion and the lamb shall lay down side by side. And the Bible said that a child shall play upon the nest of an ass. Because Joaquin, God wants to... The whole purpose for the Lord Jesus Christ coming was to help us get back to where we started. Not to take us somewhere that as a race we had never been, but to bring us back to where we started. He came, I love an old song we used to sing in the Church of God. Oh, I, I, this song, oh my God, it was a powerful song. I'll, I'll never forget it when I first heard it. The first time I heard this song, it said, looking back through the ages to an old rugged cross, ancient eyes beheld God's own Son, embracing God's promise to restore Adam's loss. How they longed for Jesus to come. <laughs> the promise was not that God was going to do something for us as a as a humanity, as a whole. He was not going to do something new, but rather he was going to restore us. He was going to give us back what we lost from the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were expelled from that garden, we are one day, once again, going to live in an Eden. We are one day, once again, going to have access to the tree of life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's going to be eaten all over again. It's going to be eaten all over again. We're going to go right back. God created Adam a living soul. A living soul. A living soul. Soul does not even begin to imply a body. Soul does not even begin to suggest mortality. You know, they say when somebody begins to get older and they begin to think about death and dying, they say, well, they're contemplating their mortality. But honey, as a soul, there is no mortality. Because the soul will live on. Like the old song says, I'll live on. Yes, I'll live on. Through eternity, I'll live on. The soul is eternal. Therefore, my friend, if you, when you say God made Adam a living soul, it is impossible to suggest that he became a flesh and blood character like you 
you and I are today. The only prohibition that God put on Adam in the Garden of Eden was, he said, listen, every tree there is good to eat. Every tree there is pleasant and pleasing. You can have anything you want from any one of them, but there's one tree I want you to leave alone. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, God, why would you deny Adam access to that tree? Just because you're being mean? Just because you're being rotten? Why? You know, sometimes we think parents make rules and they're just doing it to be mean. Remember when you were a teenager and your mom and dad said, now, I don't want you out after such and such a time, and you just thought for sure that they were only saying that to make your life miserable. Right? You just were convinced that, oh, they're just saying that to make me mad, to make me unhappy. They don't want me to be happy. They don't want me to be glad. But in reality, they knew why they were saying it. They were trying to keep you out of trouble. They were trying to keep you from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. They were trying to keep you out of the path of the drunkard coming home from the bar room late at night behind the wheel of his car when he shouldn't even have been trying to drive. You know what I'm saying? But we, we see that as we get older and we look back and we realize, I wonder if Adam didn't look back during the course of his many years on this planet, and if Adam didn't look back and realize... Oh, man, now I see why the Father said not to do that. There's something that comes with the knowledge of good and evil. There's something that comes with the knowledge of good and evil. And that something is called responsibility. And the Lord said, In the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. In other words, you will take responsibility for your actions that very day. Because with the knowledge of good and evil comes responsibility. And he turns around and Adam, as you know, is enticed by his wife and he goes in and he does what he's not supposed to have done and he winds up under the condemnation of the Lord. But Adam didn't die that day, so God must have lied. No, not at all. Because that day, the Bible tells me that God made for Adam and Eve coverings like the animals, or animal coverings. You go into the Hebrew and you literally find that it literally speaks of, it can speak of flesh. He gave them flesh is what he did. He made them. He demoted them in nature. Up until then, they were the highest thing on the planet. Do you hear me? They were the highest ranking creations on planet Earth as living souls. And when they disobeyed God, they were demoted so that now their nature was the same as the animals. Now, Brother Manuel, guess what? Now they can die. Now if they cut themselves, they'll bleed. Now if they toil in the soil and come upon a thorn, it's going to prick them and be uncomfortable and painful. Isn't that interesting? Because these all sound like the things that God said were the repercussions of their actions, doesn't it? The Lord said, now, because you've done this thing, now you're going to toil in the soil, and by the sweat of your brow you'll raise your own food. Now you're going to have to pull up the bricks, and you're going to uh, have to deal with the pain and discomfort of these things. Now you're going to have to lift the rocks, and your hands will become hardened with calluses. Now, woman, you're going to give birth to children, and it will be a painful experience. Was that a curse on women? Painful childbirth? Absolutely not. That's the stupidest thing anybody could say. The curse on woman was that she and her husband were demoted to flesh and blood. That was the curse on woman. It was the same curse as on the man. God didn't curse her greater than he cursed the man. God viewed Adam as being responsible, listen to me, regardless of who enticed him to do it. Now, if you're going to believe like so many churches believe, 
that the man is the head of the house and yada, yada, yada. Well, then, honey, you better recognize that God held Adam responsible, period. So why would he then curse Eve in a greater way for what happened? No, it doesn't work that way. They were equally cursed, and they, had, they shared the same curse. And that curse was a demoted nature. They were demoted to human form. They were demoted to flesh and blood existence. That meant that from that very day, from that very moment, they were going to die. Something that they did not have to anticipate until that moment in time. They never had to think about death and dying, but they had to that day. Because the minute you take on this stuff here, flesh and blood, honey, guess what? You're going to die. I've got news for you. You can go up to the hospital up here, up to Harry Hines, and you can go to Parkland, and you can visit the nursery. And then you can walk from the nursery over to the mortuary, to the morgue. And I can tell you of a certainty, every single baby in that nursery will one day wind up in that morgue. Because that's what happens when you're born into this existence. That's why the Bible says we're shapen in sin, born in iniquity. That doesn't mean that God creates us a bunch of sinners. No, it means that because we are born into a flesh and blood existence, we're automatically born into sin because we're automatically born into the demoted nature. We're already born into the cursed nature. From the first minute we take a breath, we're already in that cursed nature. You follow me? And as such, isn't it funny how kids, how babies, Donna, you've had children, so you know. Isn't it funny how babies, you know, you'll say, no, don't do that, slap their hand, and two seconds later, there they go again, reaching for it. Now, I've got babies that are non-human, and I'll tell you right now, they do the same thing. You can stand there and tell Coco till you turn purple, don't know, stop, don't know, stop, slap her silly, be like Tommy and, you know, bounce her off the wall with a racquetball rack and, you know, and... <laughs> but, you know, they're going to do what they want to do because any creature that has this nature that has a flesh and blood nature, whether it be a dog, a cat, or a human being, any creature that has this type of nature wants its own way. You hear me? It wants to do things its own way. That's just the nature, we call it, of man. That's the nature of, of flesh and blood. It doesn't even have to be man. It can be, you know, why do they have to put a yoke on cattle in order to get them to pull a plow and do because honey if you don't it's going to say i don't want to pull this thing and it's going to walk out into the pasture and start eating grass am i right you see because anything that is flesh and blood in nature it has its own will it wants its own way and the only way that humanity is able to subdue these other creatures is if we're able to break their will and to overcome their will with our will. Like these great animal trainers that work out there in Las Vegas, you know, have all these Bengal tigers and things like that. They're able to break the will of these tigers and make these tigers surrender to their will most of the time. <laughs> Not all the time, unfortunately, but most of the time. Because why? Because anything flesh and blood wants its own way. And the reason wild animals are called wild and domestic, uh, domesticated animals are called domesticated is because domesticated animals, their will has been broken, they've been made to surrender, and they've been bred that way for years and years and centuries so that as they're born, uh, into the next family, they're already predisposed to surrendering to you and doing what you want it to do, like domesticated horses and domesticated dogs and things like that. But a domesticated dog don't act like a wolf. 
And they tell you, don't try to take a wolf up into your home and have it as a pet. It's not a good idea. I like my cat, but honey, don't you go get yourself a mountain lion and think you're going to have it running around the house. It's not a good idea because it's a wild animal. What does that mean? It still has its own mind. It still has its own will. It still wants its own way. And you see, an animal can't understand the concept of good and evil. It can't understand that this is the right thing to do and this is the wrong thing to do. You can't just sit down with Coco and say, now, Coco, honey, here's why I want you to do it this way and reason it out with her. Because she's going to look at you all stupid with her little perky eyes, you know, and then when you're all done talking, she's going to start nibbling on your fingers and chewing on your toes, and you know, she didn't get it. She didn't get it. She didn't, she didn't care about nothing you had to say, because you can't do that. But you know what? You can do that with a human being. We have the capacity to know the difference between good and evil. We have the capacity today to know the difference between right and and wrong. Am I telling the truth? Amen. And this is one of the this is one of the great things we inherited from our great 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 grandfather Adam. But you know the word of the Lord tells us in Romans chapter four and verse fifteen, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Where no law is, there is no transgression. If you don't put up a speeding sign, you have no right nor authority to stop somebody and give them a ticket for speeding. Because where no law is, there is no transgression. If God had put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden and never said to Adam, you cannot take up that one tree, then whether Adam ate of it or not, it would have made no difference. He would not have broken any law because no law was given. No law was stated if that had been the case. But the problem with Adam was that a law had been given. So you see, the problem was not at all with what would happen. The devil is such a liar. You know, when he appeared to Eve and began to talk to her, the devil is such a deceiver. Oh, God just knows that you're going to be as gods. He knows that you'll be as gods. What a lying sack of mud that devil was to say that to Eve that day. He knew that their nature would be demoted and not premoted. The devil will make you think that you're going to have it better when in reality you're going to have it worse. The devil's going to make you think you're going to be happier when in reality you're going to be more miserable. Do you hear me now? The devil's going to make you think that you're going to uh, have company and companionship when in reality you will never be lonelier in your life because the devil is a liar. He'll both things tell you one thing knowing good and well that you're going to get the exact opposite of what he's telling you. You hear me now? And that's what he did in the Garden of Eden with Eve that day. He said, oh, God just knows that y'all will be as God. But Satan knew. The Bible tells us, I believe in Ezekiel, that nothing could be hid from him. Satan knew everything. He was privy to everything that was going on in God's creation. And he knew what would happen to Adam and Eve if they partook of that fruit. He knew what would happen. But he turns around and says, Oh, God just knew y'all would become as God. That's why he didn't want you to eat that. Because y'all would, would be promoted in nature. You'd be bigger and better and faster and more wonderful than you are today. When in reality, well, Keith, they were going to, they were going to wind up falling down a number of steps, and, and they were suddenly going to find themselves at the same level, scientifically, as animals. But where there is no law, brother, there is no transgression. 
The Bible said in Ecclesiastes 12, 14, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, the word of the Lord tells us, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people, a lot of people want to call this preacher a liar. A lot of people want to say that this preacher out here preaching a message that is full of lies and deceiving people and leading people to destruction. I get all kinds of junk email all the time from people who want to believe that way. And you know, it cracks me up, Brother Willie, because it took me a long time to realize that the church was calling a lot of good people evil. Come on now. It was calling a lot of good people evil. They weren't evil. They were good people. But the church labeled them evil because they didn't understand them and they didn't want to understand them. And therefore, immediately, they just put a big broad label on them of evil, ungodly. I remember a time when, even in my lifetime, in my near 30 years, I remember when you couldn't see a black man walking down the street, but that somebody would come out with a comment about what no good he probably was up to. Because of the color of his skin, he was presumed evil. Are you hearing me today? Am I telling the truth today? It's easy to presume people evil. But I've got news for you today. Evil is not what you are. Evil is what you do. Do you hear me now? I got news for you. My Bible tells me that there's a war going on between my spirit and my flesh. My flesh wants to do one thing. My spirit wants to do another. And Paul says, no matter what I do, evil is always present in me. I've got news for you. Evil is not who you are. It is what you do. You will have evil in you until Jesus comes. You'll have evil in you until the rapture. You'll have evil in you until the Holy Ghost from heaven purges it from your soul at the time of the redemption of the church. But I want you to know today, evil is not who you are. It is what you do. It's not about who you are, but it's about what choices you make. I get tired of the church labeling people evil because they're gay or lesbian. Evil is not who you are. Evil is what you do. It's not evil to be gay or lesbian. It's not evil to be black. It is not evil to be anything that you simply are. Because that's what you are. I know in, in the dark ages, they believed if a person was born mentally retarded or had certain handicaps, they believed that was a curse of God on them. That they had somehow, that their family or someone had, had brought this curse upon, you know, that individual. Look at the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. A man is born blind and they say to the Lord, Lord, tell us, who sins, this man or his, or his parents? that he should be born blind because the presumption was that there was some evil present that brought this blindness upon this person. And the Lord said, Neither this man nor his parents, but rather that the glory of God should be made manifest in him. Honey, I want you to know who sent you or your parents that you were born gay or lesbian? I'm telling you right now, neither, but rather this was done that the glory of God might be shown forth in your life, that God might reveal himself inside of you and show the world what he can do so that God can reveal the depth and the height of his glory, of his power, of his grace, of his love, of his mercy, glory to God. That's why it's there. It don't have nothing 
to do with evil. Evil is not who you are. It is what you do. Adam and Eve, their sin was not eating the fruit. Their sin was disobeying God. It was what they did. But a lot of people would say, well, what they did was they ate the fruit they weren't supposed to eat. Yes, but in so doing, they broke a higher law. God had told them not to do that. So therefore, the higher law was that they disobeyed God. Disobedience, that's the key. Now, you can be who you are, and I want you to know, you can live your life and obey God. You can be who you are, and you can know the difference between good and evil. You can be who you are, and you can live your life and make the right choices. Come on now. So that rather than living out an evil existence, you're living out a godly existence. Am I right now? It doesn't matter whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or ugly. I want you to know you can make the choices to live out a godly existence. Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14. The Apostle Paul was writing to the Hebrew church, the Hebrew people, and said, For when... For the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. I got news for you, honey. They're preachers that get up in their pulpit and preach all that condemnation and all that garbage, and they preach people into hell instead of preaching people into heaven, and they tear them down instead of building them up. All those preachers that are preaching that same message, and they're in the majority today, and we're in the minority today, but take our children because you have passed from milk to me, hallelujah. You're no longer being poured over with milk. You're no longer being torn up by people who are unskillful in the word of God, who don't understand the word of righteousness, who don't understand the foundation principles of this gospel. No, we have stepped up one step higher, hallelujah. And now we understand the truth of God's grace. We understand the truth of God's love. We understand the truth of God's mercy. And hallelujah, we're sitting down this morning to Satan to some age, and we're not going to have any more cream of wheat. Hallelujah. Because strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. A lot of people have a hard time really understanding this message that I preach. Of course they do. All their life they've been in a church that feeds them milk. And when you throw a steak in front of them, they can't even begin to digest it. You hear me now? When suddenly there's a big hunk of meat in front of them, they just don't know what to do with it. They're like a little baby with gums and no teeth. And they, I can't deal with that. I can't chew that. I cannot possibly digest that. But I want you to know today, that this revival that God has begun, and it's a big, it's going to be a big one when it's all said and done. This revival that God has begun of a new and better understanding of the grace of God. That's what this revival, this isn't a gay lesbian revival. This is a revival of a greater understanding of the grace of God. Some years ago, we went through a period of time where we had what was called the Jesus Revival, where there was a revival of an understanding of the importance of Jesus' name. And even in a lot of Trinitarian churches, they begin to understand once again the importance 
of Jesus' name and just how important the name of the Lord is and, and what a significant role it plays in the church. And many churches, even many Trinitarian churches, begin to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Because there was a revival of Jesus' name. It wasn't a revival that was a part of any one denomination or any one group or any one race or any one people, but rather it was a revival that transcended every barrier and reached into all different kinds of churches. Amen. And I want you to know today that there is a revival that God has begun of a fresh understanding of the grace of God. Because the doctrine of grace has been so polluted and so diluted and so ruined that when it is presented to someone in its current polluted form, it ruins the person that it touches. And instead of saving their soul and setting their spirit on fire and putting joy in their heart, instead of that, it places them under the heavy weight and bondage of religion and religiosity and pharisaicalism. But there's a revival of the understanding of grace. Brother Willie, when your sister finally slides into this revival and understands the grace of God, the way God meant for His grace to be understood, when she finally slips in there and gets out of that high hair and long dress mentality of, oh, I've got to do all this to be perfect and holy before God. Honey, I'm going to tell you what. If there was somebody in this life who was holy, I would think it would have been the Apostle Paul. I would think. God used the man to write the majority of the New Testament. Surely Paul had a relationship I don't know a single church that would disagree with this comment. Surely he had a relationship that was close to God. Surely he had a relationship that was real. Surely this man could be qualified as a sanctified, holy, living, godly man. And yet, even Paul himself, by his own hands, could write and say, When I would do good, I don't do it. And the good that I would do, I don't do. But the evil that I would not do without fail, that's what I find myself doing. Isn't that what Paul wrote willing? So you see, if Paul can acknowledge the conflict, then sweetheart, take down your hair, take up your dresses, and realize today that as long as you are in flesh and blood form, you will never stand perfect before God. You will never stand holy before God. But what you need to stand before God as is a believer. You need to hold on to your faith as tenaciously as you hold on to anything in your life. And don't let it go. And don't let any devil, don't let any pope, don't let any priest, don't let any pastor, don't let any prophet, don't let anybody tear your faith out of your hands. Glory to God. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. You're going to have to endure this life. You're going to have to get to the other side of this journey. And you're going to have to have your faith in Jesus Christ intact if you're going to win in the end. Hallelujah. From milk to meat. <sighs> Took me a long time, Manuel, to realize. Seriously, I'm not kidding. When I came into the affirming movement, you know. Every step of this thing was a thing that I had to achieve between me and God. Every step of it. Because I didn't go to anybody and say, teach me. I didn't buy any books and say, you know, teach me. I searched the scriptures and I began to delve and to dive and to let the Spirit of the Lord talk to me. I said, Lord, you better show me some things. And really, I started Grace Oasis Ministries in 1993. But I can tell you, the first four years of that, I still was very uncertain about a lot of things. I still had not come to terms with a lot of things. It took me a long time to wrestle through a lot of issues. But when I finally 
broke through that barrier. And I finally came through on the other side of all that demonic opposition, all the crap that I've been taught, all the junk that I've been preached at all my life. When I finally came through all of that and came through on the other side, I realized, Brother Willie, I wasn't in the Waffle House anymore. Now I'm in the Steakhouse. <laughs> Hallelujah! All of a sudden, the meals looked a whole lot nicer. They looked a whole lot more satisfying. Now when I preach, I love when I preach, because now when I preach, there's such a glorious satisfaction in it. It leaves such a wonderful taste in my mouth, because, well, the words that are coming forth are from the throne of God, and the meat of this thing is glorious and wonderful and satisfying. Hallelujah! And I've never had more people come to me and say, Brother Mara, I've never heard anybody preach like you do. It's the most, I love your preaching, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not bragging on me. Do not misunderstand me. Because I don't, I'm not saying that about myself. I'm saying that's what people have told me, you know. But you know why? Because God led me from the land of milk and honey to the land of meat and potatoes. <laughs> Hallelujah! I'm so glad I'm not down there anymore at the Pancake House, but now, glory to God, I'm up there at Steak and Ale. Woo! Amen. And I'll tell you what, children, I'm going to tell you. I mean, it, it, when you come to church and when we hear, when we have Bible study, we study, you can just feel the depth. You can feel the substance, you know, in what we're talking about. Yeah. This isn't trying to rewrite the Scriptures. This isn't trying to make it say what we want it to say. No, if that's all it was, you wouldn't feel that big old six-inch thick steak up in your mouth when we go to church and hear the word of the Lord. Come on now. Brother Willie, if all we were trying to do was rewrite the Bible, make it say what we wanted it to say, we'd be less than milk, we'd be powdered milk mixed with water. But you know what? I got news for you. I know the difference between milk and meat. Come on now. I know the difference between the taste of 2% milk and a nice, juicy USDA steak. And I want you to know this message that we're preaching today, it ain't milk, honey. It's good old-fashioned 100% meat. Glory to God. It's good for your soul. It'll help you make heaven. It'll help you make the right choices. It'll help you to know the difference between good and evil. It'll help you to know that you as a person are not evil, but you can do evil if you so choose. And you as a person are not good. That's one reason I hate when I hear all these politicians talk about around the world. They say, well, we got a few evil people that trying to do, uh-uh, wrong. Wrong. These aren't evil people. You want to hear a prophetic statement? You want to hear a prophetic statement? Listen to me now. Quit talking to each other and listen to me. I'm a serious heart attack. I've got a prophetic statement for you right this minute. God has said to my spirit, I am offended at this nation because it has convinced itself that it controls its own destiny. The people and the government have come to believe that their choices frame the destination of this nation. He said, but it is I who frame the destination of this nation. It is I that frame the destination of this people. You can elect this president anyone you want to, and I will still have the courts decide in the direction that I would have them to go. Can you not realize that we've had a Republican president and the courts are practically giving gay marriage all over the place? Doesn't that tell you that God is saying it doesn't matter who you elect? 